Hello and welcome to another episode of the Futurum Tech Webcast. I'm your host, Stephen Dickens. We're here to talk about Ripple's CBDC platform, and I'm joined by Pav Agaror from the Diaspora Bank Project. Hey, Pav, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's get the listeners and viewers orientated. Tell us a little bit what you do on the Diaspora Bank Project. Uh, sure. So uh, I'm right now a chair of the Technology and Innovation Committee at the African Chamber of Digital Commerce. And uh, one of the initiatives of the African Chamber is to connect the African diaspora with the continent. So we're doing that through a number of ways. Remittances are a large uh, scope of, of their connection. But unfortunately, right now, about 10% of the $90 billion that uh, African diaspora send back home is just wasted by third parties like Western Union and MoneyGram. So we're, we're trying to, to, instead of those fees being wasted, we're trying to redirect those as, as form of investments that the diaspora can, can directly own uh, assets and, and capacity building projects in their homeland. So tell me a little bit, of, I mean, that's obviously makes sense. There's a lot of friction in that remittances process that's costing everybody in that cycle kind of money and causing, as I say, friction. Where do you see the role of CBDCs in that as being a platform to innovate? Right. So, so CBDCs are both a seamless payment rail, but also they enable more um, sort of multi platform functionalities and and more enterprise use cases of digital assets that wouldn't be possible with just your crypto or your stable coins. So with CBDCs, you can now enable investment vehicles uh, for the diaspora. You can now enable uh, microfinance. You can now enable different use cases that even the CBDC pilots like the e Naira uh, pilot in Nigeria uh, was having issues with. But if you now combine CBDCs with remittances, you unlock a lot greater possibilities. It's interesting what you mentioned there. I'm interested to understand a little bit more from an inclusion point of view and some of those cross-border payments that you talked about. So maybe let's frame it so that we talk about both of those. The inclusion piece for me, crucial. How do we bring on the region and get more people banked and get more people access to these funds? And then the cross-border piece, obviously a lot of countries in Africa, but also that money coming in and out from around the world. So maybe if you can talk a little bit about inclusion and then a little bit about what you're doing from a cross-border payments and remittances perspective, and how you leverage the XRP ledger and the CBDC platform from uh, from Ripple in order to do that? We're actually using remittances and cross-border payments as a vehicle for financial inclusion. So right now in the continent, most people actually have to find their nearest physical branch. Unlike in the West, most of the population lives in rural areas. So they have to walk tens of kilometers to find their nearest physical banks to be able to access their funds. Um, so we're working with the network of the Association of Microbanks in Nigeria to enable people to access their remittance funds directly on mobile banking and be able to then use them locally. So offering an, an off-ramp for their remittances. Um, and in addition, we'll allow microfinance uh, pooled funds of funds that will be a, a portion of the remittances to serve as as collateral for loans and uh, enable greater access to microfinance. So it's fascinating there listening to you talk about that. It's how you, it's both remittances and payments being leveraged to drive inclusion, which is fascinating. I would saw them as two separate buckets. Interesting to hear how you're linking those. One of the things I'm really interested in is how the Diaspora project is using some of those native features, be that in the XRP ledger, be that in the CBDC platform, and specifically how you're driving near 0% free flow, fee flow 
for some of those cross-border remittances. If you could expand on that, that would be fantastic. Sure, sure. So, so one of the great features of, of the XRP ledger is authorized trust lines. And in our case, we really use them for what in traditional finance is known as correspondent banking. So as, as a neo bank, we will have a correspondent account with all central banks that have a live CBDC in circulation. So the idea is that when remittances are sent, we'll have a liquidity pool of both stable coins and CBDC. And with an authorized trust line, it only has to be enabled once to be able to allow seamless conversion between stable coins and CBDCs. And once that's done, that's sort of instantly settled. Um, and, and Ripple is one of at the forefront of that because Ripple uh, led with, with RippleNet that a lot of uh, commercial banks were using in place before. Uh, so now you can have seamless conversion between uh, CBDCs and stable coins, and that allows final settlement because that, that's one of the, the key requirements of, settlement, of central banks is to, to have uh, Forex settled before conversion to CBDC. Um, and the, the other thing you can do is hooks, which allow a sort of parsing or split of your remittance or transaction. So this allows us to populate the investment wallet that we uh, automatically allocate. So 5% of every remittance that sends, say you send $1,000, $50 automatically is populated in your investment wallet and Ripple's native hooks uh, allow us to do that. Okay, fascinating. Particularly that investment wallet being able to sort of apply an amount there and a percentage. So. If you could describe some of the, the unique projects and opportunities that this Diaspora Bank project and how that's going to enable new feature function for you end users. I, I can see lots of sort of sparks going here in my own mind, but want to understand a little bit about some of the opportunities that you see. Sure. So the end users on our side are both in the diaspora and on the continent, right? So with our network of both the diaspora community and our local partnerships with central banks, with microfinance banks, with, with sovereign national investment vehicles. This sort of enables a whole new level of not just financial e inclusion, but an economic engine for the continent. So now this is this streamlines this efficiency of, of development. So now the diaspora is directly owners of capacity building projects and of infrastructure that's needed in their community. So they're going to have an investment marketplace where a member of the diaspora can choose, okay, uh, if I'm really interested in connectivity, uh, agricultural projects, uh, more uh, educational literacy, what have you, there's a specific projects that they can invest in and they have ownership of it and of course they have guaranteed returns that they will get after certain fixed periods uh, so there's really now you have an investment marketplace um, you are enabling microfinance banks to be able to operate with greater transparency and efficiency um, because now you have a, an investment marketplace, so they have to streamline their practices, and and it's it's all transparent uh, for for the diaspora and community to to see where their money is going. So, Pav, this has been a fantastic conversation. Particularly interesting for me the linkage between remittances and inclusion. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure, Stephen. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share a bit about what we're doing. Yeah, really fascinating. You've been listening to the Future in Tech webcast. I'm your host, Stephen Dickens. Please do all those things like click and subscribe and tell your friends. It helps with the algorithm. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>